Okay, so uh, oh, okay. yeah, I just said few words. Uh, well, it's a spring break, so uh, this usually it's a full room. Um, uh, so, for most around my year, uh, he's been working in uh, uh, City College, New York, uh, distinguished physics professor, as I learned right now. It's obvious without even reading CV, and there is no sub very little, there's not many subjects which uh, he didn't touch in his career. Uh, and, uh, this is Toriton, Sanomo, Twisters, Sherm Simon series, um, and also hydrodynamics, which probably his first love, which <laughs> Here is through the career, right? So uh, being a, a postdoc of uh, Jackie, right? A postdoc or student? No, I, I worked with him, not, not, not so no, neither postdoc, but, <laughs> no, but on early, in early days. Yes, right? yes I worked with uh, So they wrote fundamental papers on uh, hydrodynamics. Uh, and uh, uh, interesting to the subject, keep, keep to geometrical aspects of hydrodynamics, keep going on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul, for the invitation. I mean, it's spring break, I understand, but uh, thanks for coming anyway. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, topological terms, if you want some anomalies, uh, a bit about Chan Simon's theories, or in fluid dynamics. So uh, there are some technical things I'll be talking about, so it may be nice to sort of go over a, an overview initially, just so you know where we are going and so on. Um, and as you all know, there has been a lot of interest recently gauge gravitational anomalies all in the fluid dynamics context. Chiral magnetic effect is very much, has been very much talked about, uh, important effect, which is related to anomalies and so on. And also in the co context of quantum power fluids, superfluids, some kind of matter physics and so on. Now, we'll not be talking very much about these things here. But what I'm going to say is on a related, but a little bit, little bit more subtle issue. Uh, and what I'm going to do is a formalism for fluids based on group theory. So I want to introduce you to this idea a little bit. It's not the usual canonical textbook approach to fluid dynamics. Uh, and the argument is basically very simple. Uh, many of you may recall how Lagrange originally derived fluid dynamics starting from Newton's equations. You write down an equation motion for a, a large number of particles, then you introduce some kind of coarse graining so that you can introduce a notion of a particle density and a flow velocity for the, for the fluid. And then once you coarse grain Newton's equations appropriately, they becomes the equations for hydrodynamics, okay? So the although Euler had done it directly in terms of uh, mass densities and velocities, the branch derived it more from Newton's equations by a course graining method. Okay. Now, of course, the one thing that strikes you when you look over this again, you know, the branch was in 1700s, 1800s, but now, you know, in 2000, you look, look at it, you realize there's something missing, which is that we don't think of point particles in the old sense of little things which are moved around by Newton's equations motion. For us, a point particle is really a unitary irreducible representation of the Poincare. So that's, if you like, the only definition of a point particle that we can, in the modern language, use very abstract, but nevertheless, that is the only sensible one we can do. So if that's the case, then you ask, can I do a Lagrange trick on this notion of a point particle and obtain some sort of hydrodynamics? That's a question I want to start with. And the answer is yes. If you're looking for unitary and irreducible representation of a group, not just Poincare, any, pretty much any D groups, you can obtain it by quantizing the core joint orbit actions of a group. Okay, so the core joint orbit action is an action that is classical, which upon quantization gives you one particular representation 
labeled by various parameters in the action, which uh, is a quantum Hilbert space of the theory. Okay. So uh, this way we can actually get inertia of the representation of concrete. So we take this idea and course within a large number of particles, a la Lagrange, and that should lead us to a kind of a group theoretic way of thinking about fluid dynamics. So that's the basic approach that I'm using in most of what I'm going to talk about. Okay, I'll say more technical details shortly. Uh, so it, it turns out that what is the advantage of doing this? The advantage is you see it's entirely based on group theory and symmetry. So anytime you have issues related to symmetry, they're very naturally embedded in this way of looking at hydrodynamics, okay? In particular, let's say you want to do the standard model of particle physics, and imagine that you have heated up the system to such a high temperature, that not only is, uh, is there deconfinement of quarks and gluons, but even this, you know, the weak interaction sector, everything goes into some fluid, plasma kind of phase of the theory. And then you can ask, okay, if that's the case, how do I represent anomalies in terms of the fluid language? There should be a way to do that precisely because anomalies have a topological character and just the fact that I heated up the theory and changed the phase of the theory should not matter, okay? And however, having formulated fluid dynamics in terms of group theory, anomalies become very naturally embedded into this because they're also phrased in terms of group transformations. And one can do that. You get chiral magnetic effects, chiral vorticity effects, all these things are easily built into that. Now, the point, however, that I want to focus on for today's talk is a little bit more subtle. It turns out that if you look at something like a sigma model, then it's possible to have a conflict between diffeomorphism invariance so of the target space and of the base space. Recall, sigma model means I have a map from the base space, which is space time into some target space, okay? So in general, you have diffeomorphism symmetries that you can talk about both at the target level and at base level. So it could happen that there is a conflict between diffeomorphism invariance of target and base, in which case you are forced into some sort of a diffeomorphism anomaly, okay? And that is the kind of subtlety that I would like to talk about today. What does it mean, for example, it would lead to anomalies in a commutator algebra for the energy moment and time scale. There'll be anomalous terms if you try to write down commutation rules. It can, so this can also happen in fluids. Uh, I will start with this simple model example to illustrate the point, but I'll apply it to fluids. And let me also say that the immediate motivation to think about this came, for me at least, came from the work of uh, Paul and uh, also Paul and uh, um, Sasha Bano. Um, they considered a fluid of vortices in two plus one dimensional superfluids and also applicable to Hall effect. And so you consider kind of a, a secondary fluid made of vortices in, inside the primary fluid. Okay. And in that case, um, okay, first of all, analysis of fluids of vortices is, is an old subject. It goes back to the late 1800s work of Kirchhoff. And in fact, even in the 1895 edition of Lamb's book, you've seen about five, six sections devoted to this discussion of war disease and all the things that happened there, okay? And in fact, one of the key results that Kirchhoff showed, which I'll mention again, is that if you look at a vortex in a fluid, so you have some kind of a line vortex, you have two transverse coordinates, transverse to the, the, the vortex line itself, and these two are Poisson conjugate to each other, okay? Which was a very important result, which means that if you try to do the quantum theory, these two coordinates don't commute, okay? which for some of you might remind you of Hall effect and things like that, okay? And now what Hall and uh, Sasha did is to consider that a secondary fluid made of large number of vortices, and then utilizing Kirchhoff's work, you can look at the quantum hydrodynamics of this fluid, okay? So this is the secondary vortex fluid that we are talking about. And the key result they found is an anomalous commutator algebra. There is an extension of the algebra, but these anomalous terms, or you, you might say Schwinger terms in the commutator algebra, 
Uh, they're not central terms, as in the Venezuela case, for example. And uh, you know, you can ask where do they come from, and so on. Okay. So the reason why this is a little puzzling is, you know, when we talk about if a morphism anomaly, the we think of them as being related to gravitational anomalies. And, but on the other hand, if you are in two plus one dimensions or in four, even in three plus one dimensions, you don't expect gravitational anomalies. That's the, the usual uh, lore about gravitational anomalies is that, you know, you don't see them except in, you know, two, six, 10, that sort of dimension. Uh, and therefore you might say, where do these come from? If I am going to have commutator anomalies in femorphism, and I don't have gravitational anomalies in either two plus one or three plus one, doesn't matter, then where do they come from? Okay. So this is the kind of question I want to ask. Okay. So what I'm going to do then is to take just standard fluid dynamics. I will add some topological terms and show that this in fact leads to this anomalous commutator algebra that I mentioned here. Uh, I will do a few three plus one dimensional cases as well at this mention what they are. We'll consider, for example, a fluid of knots I can consider, just as you consider vortices, vortex lines can twist and make a knot. And if the knot is sufficiently compact, you can then consider knots moving around also. And what happens in that case, things of that sort we can do, okay? Now, before I embark on the technicalities, let me also say, so what are we trying to do here? There is a commutator algebra with anomalous terms. It's a bit similar to what happens with, say, the Katsumudi algebra, right? Katsumudi algebra has, you know, it's an extension of the E group algebra. There's some central term and so on. Um, yeah, so you have the algebra. However, you can say, instead of looking at the algebra, I can ask, is there an action which via canonical quantization would lead to this centrally extended terms in the Katsumudi algebra? Okay, and we know there is an action that is a famous Mesomeno with an action. So that is the analogy that I would like to say that the algebra that Paul and Sasha derive is there, but is there an action based derivation that we can get? That's essentially the idea. So, uh, yes, please. So this, uh, this term that this extra topological term that you're saying that you're adding to the standard fluid Lagrangian. Mm -hmm. So, my understanding is that, like, like, you know, as an effective field theory, you study the constitutive relations, like the stress tensor as a derivative expansion, yeah. current as a derivative expansion. Yeah. And then like, uh, you know, for example, Son discovered that at least in three plus one dimensions, you can add this term, which captures the chiral anomalies, uh, this thing. Mm -hmm. So you're suggesting that there is another term which can be added? No, I think the my claim is that the terms which, uh you might add in terms of the currents that derived ultimately from an action, which I can formulate in terms of group variance. That is the statement. Okay. So I don't have to think in terms of currents or energy one and tensors. I just give an action and everything else would follow from that. And, uh, I see. Uh, and, and in, like, but but like I mean, uh, I mean th this this new anomaly should be observable at the level of constitutive relations as well. I mean, um, yeah, I think it can be observed, but I don't. Okay, there's a partial answer to that question that will emerge from what I'm going to show you. Okay, um, but I'm not sure. If, uh, I can show you any explicitly the current and the terms that come from it. There presumably is, but I haven't spent too much time thinking about it. Okay. But however, there are constitutive relations and the importance of um, how these extra terms arise should be clear from what I'm going to show you. Okay. Ask me again at the end. If, if, so. All right. Uh, I'm also then going to try and relate this a little bit to the Chan Simons theory. Um, and uh, the papers are all listed here and so on. Okay, so let me go on to the, the main idea. Because the idea is we're going to look at first a sigma model, and I'm going to add a topological term to the sigma model, which creates this conflict between the target space and the base space that I mentioned. Okay. How does it work? And the simplest example you can do is let's 
take two plus one dimensions, I'm going to take the target space to be the complex predictive space. Okay, so that's uh, two, two complex dimensions. You can think of it as a C3 mod U2, if you like. Okay, that's a space, target space I'm talking about. The important thing is that this is a nice scalar manifold. There is a scalar two form, and the potential, the one form potential for the two form is given in this fashion where U is an element of SU3. The T8 is U, the standard hypercharged T8 direction in the SU3 algebra. Okay. So if you look at this as a one form, it shifts under U1 transformations on the right. U1 is part of this U2 here. That's a hypercharged direction, if you like. And therefore, A is not well defined as an entity that lives on CP2, okay? Because it shifts under these transformations. However, so as a one form on SU3 is fine, but doesn't descend to the, to the objective space. But if you take omega, which is a derivative of that, this extra term goes away, and therefore DA is well defined for CP2. Okay. So that's again well known. This is the Keller 2 form. And the important thing about CP2 is that the fourth cohomology is non-trivial, but so is the second cohomology, but that's not the point for me. So omega where to omega, which is a four form, can be thought of as an element of H4. Okay. That's a basic topology that's going to be useful for us. Now, what it means is that I can define a gamma, which is a three form, by saying that omega where to omega is D of gamma. Again, gamma is not going to be globally defined, be that as it may, we can take this gamma and then construct a single model action like so. Okay, so this is a standard term, the metric on the space CP2, the target space, the fields. So this is just like the pion action that we write down. And here is the topological term. Okay. The important thing is that this is not well defined on CP2, shifts by a total derivative, but that does not affect the equations of motion. So classically, the theory is well defined. Kind of mechanically, there'll be some. It, it'll still be well defined with some quantization conditions on the coefficients. Yeah. Okay. So that's the action I want to talk about. And the, once you have this action, the rest of the calculation is fairly simple and straightforward. All you have to do is to say, let me look at the energy bond tensor because that's the thing I want to focus on. So remember, this is the action. You introduce the little a and little b and so on. Those are target space indices. The mu is the space time index. So put this in curved space, vary with respect to the metric. I will get my energy one tensor. So that's the. So gamma A, the A index is a target space index. A is a target space index. So it runs over the yeah, CP1, 2, 3, 4 for CP2. Mu is the space time index here. It's two plus one dimensional space. Two plus one dimensional. And I can replace the D's in such a way that there is a metric here and so on. I mean, put it in code so, space. I mean, this, so this last coupling, so I think of this, the gamma is a three form. I think of this as what, a pullback of the three form. It's a pullback of the three form onto space time. I'm only showing you the time derivative part. You could add the space derivative parts here, but uh, since I focus on the canonical structure, I just wrote this particular term, okay? okay? But in principle, it's a full three form pull back to the space-time manifold that you're writing. Is that, is that okay? And this is true for any course. Right? Uh, yeah, so exactly. use this particular CP2, but... I chose it to illustrate that I need something for which I have, a, say in this example, I have a fourth cohomology which is well-defined, but the free form will not be well-defined shifts by so it is like a resume in a term in that sense that it shifts under certain yeah but, yeah. but it could be realized for oh yeah any coset uh, g slash h uh, but yes, you this particular example. this is just the, right. is this is example. just the simplest example okay i could even do su3 su2 mod u1 but then it's a little more involved because i don't have an h4 for that case okay. so that doesn't quite work but this, so this is the lowest example of group coset for which I can do this game in two plus one dimensions. But you don't need a group coset for, for this construction so far. Right? I'm sorry? You could take it any four manifold. Any four manifold. Yeah, it doesn't even have to be a group coset, any four manifold. Give me a non trivial H4 element. Yeah. I can play this game. Yeah, because you'll have a, volume, a compact four manifold. Yeah. That's right. 
That's true. You can always do the same. Thing. Yeah, that's all. That's all that matters. Okay. So this is only to illustrate the point, actually. Okay. Um, okay. So the point is that the the key observation here is that this being a pullback of a top three form, there's no no metrical factor here, and therefore this does not contribute to the energy one and tensor. It just comes from the first term. It's like so. Okay. Which is fine. Now I look at the generator of the transformation of spatial diffeomorphisms. So I take the T0i component, I integrate with some test function. Here is my generator. I can write it in terms of the canonical momentum, trade the phi dot for canonical momentum, looks like that. Notice that this looks a bit like uh, a covariant derivative on the target space. So that's why I use the letter D for that. And you just straightforwardly sit down and compute the commuted algebra. And here's what you find. Okay. So you find the first term, which is what you expect based on diffeomorphism, how diffeomorphisms work as a group. But the second term is kind of an anomalous term okay, that arises from this. And this arises precisely because this object was not well defined uh, on the time space. Okay. So we have this commutator algebra. There's an anomaly here. But then notice that. If I take this, I can just subtract this funny term that I have here. Notice that this whole thing came from this gamma here. And if I just drop this gamma by hand, then this is simply saying replace pi by xi dot d pi. That's just diffeomorphism. So if I eliminate this gamma term, define a, a script t by subtracting out gamma, it's just that, and obeys the standard non anomalous computation. Okay. So what is the problem here? The problem is that this term that you have to add or subtract to get the commutation rules in the form you like is not well defined on the target space. Okay. So I can define these commutation rules, non-anomalous diffeomorphism commutation rules for the base space transformations, but the generators themselves are not well defined on the target space. On the other hand, if I use these guys here, I have an anomaly. These are well-defined on the target space. There is no problem. Okay. Precisely because this is in the form of a covariant derivative on the target space. Okay. So therefore, that is the conflict between the two diffeomorphisms that I mentioned. I mentioned that if I insist on something that is diffeomorphism invariance in the target, I have to live with an anomaly in the base space. Okay. So this is the peculiar situation. Okay. So this is what I would like to show in the fluid case. Is that everything? Okay. So a, a similar structure can happen in fluid dynamics. That's what we're going to talk about. Okay. So let me say a few things about fluid, the, the specific context of the fluid dynamics. So we are going to look at this, the same example from uh, our paper. Uh, we consider, say, rotating superfluid helium, number of individual vortices here, rotating like this. Uh, this, and assume that there's a huge number of vortices here. This state is the state of chiral flow, if you like. Everything goes the same way. Uh, effectively, two-dimensional problem, even though there may be a third dimension. So we're going to use complex coordinates, x plus i, y, and then the vortex positions obey these equations. So these are the equations which the, 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 this term here is what essentially comes from Kirchhoff's work. This is because an overall angle of rotation has been added to the system. That's omega is the angle of velocity. Okay. So these are the individual uh, equa equations of motion for the individual vortices. And the idea is to then develop a fluid description for this. Uh, the Hamiltonian for the case is also easy to read off from here. Notice there is an omega z bar, and this is one over z alpha minus z beta. So it comes from a logarithm. So here's a Hamiltonian. And this is the Kirchhoff statement that the two coordinates are Poisson conjugate to each other. Okay. So all that is uh, simple and clear. What uh, uh, Paul and Sasha did was to look at the end vortices, take large and limit and look at the diffeomorphism generator or the momentum density, and here is what they find. Okay, I won't drive this because I'm going to show you 
another way to get to it. Sure. The first term here is essentially what you expect on canonical grounds for diffeomorphisms, and these are the anomalous terms here. Okay, the rho is some density, uh, and the rest is gamma, it's just the strength of the vortex. Uh, this strength gamma, it's taken to be the same for everybody. That's why it's just a common gamma. That's what happens. Is this basically a classical anomaly? Effectively classical so far. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's no, it's not coming from, <clears throat> I mean, normally when I think about an anomaly, I think about some action that has a classical symmetry that's violated. And here it looks like the classical symmetry itself didn't exist. Well, no, there is one additional piece here, which is that um, in their calculation, they took a quantum ground state where the P acting on the ground state is zero, and that is crucial for this, actually. So there is some quantum ingredient here. Uh, okay. So you, you quantize this, a large number of vortices, you construct a quantum ground state wave function, and then you analyze the algebra acting on it. Okay. And that's how this term came out. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. That's what I meant by adding this caveat here. Okay. So, so there is some quantum ingredient. Uh, there's also a constitutive relation because the density of vortices is related to the actual fluid vorticity and angular velocity in this fashion. This is nothing, um, you know, surprising because there's an overall rotation and the uh, density of vortices should be related to, you know, after you take out the overall rotation, the rest of it you divide as vorticity for n vortices and so on. So therefore, there should be a relation like this, okay? I won't go more into it. It's just a constitutive relation. It is physically well motivated, but we won't play much of a role in what I'm going to say, okay? I mean, it will play a role, but not really. Where it comes from is not so important for us. Okay, so now let me tell you about thinking about fluid dynamics in a, a group theory terms. And, um, and here is how we do that. Okay, the simplest way is to construct an action using the Klebsch parameterization, parameterization for velocities. Okay, so with the velocity I can write as di of theta alpha di beta. Okay, this is the standard Klebsch parameterization. Once I have a Klebsch parameterization, it's possible to write this action for fluid dynamics. This is also well known. This is not uh, a new statement. The idea that you need Klebsch parameters to write an action for fluid dynamics, that has been known for decades, actually goes back to 1950s, if I remember right, um, which you might say is still a bit surprising because you know fluid dynamics is as old as Newton and Bernoulli's work, but the action for that was only written down in the 50s grade using Klebsch parameterization, which is this, okay? So you write a theta dot, alpha beta dot. So that's essentially like the time component of this multiplied by rho, the density, and this is your Hamilton. Okay, so that's your action. I can eliminate the space component also via a Lagrange multiplier, then it looks like this, which is nice because this now looks more covariant. This part, and you can try down the action. Okay. Now, one thing I want to say is that it's also possible, and this is a, uh, not so obvious from the Klebsch parameterization, but it is possible to write it in terms of a group element. If you take SU11 element, G, write, it, write down this G inverse DG with say, this is the poly matrix sigma three, you just expand out G in some parameterization, this is the parameterization I use. It comes out to be d theta plus alpha d theta. Okay, these are the various parameters. Okay, so this is sort of nice, um, and it suggests that there is an SU11 way of looking at this action. Now, of course, um, now first let me write down the action. So notice that this is rho d mu theta plus alpha d mu beta. I can make rho and j like a current, and these are the time and space derivatives. So it looks like this. So that's your fluid action, consistent with relativistic invariance. And g is an element of SU11, as I wrote it. And you can show that this gives you all the standard equations of uh, relativistic hydrodynamics. 
Uh, this function f, of course, is what is specific to the fluid. The first term is common to any kind of fluid that you talk about. The difference between different types of fluids is in the choice of f, which is indeed related to the energy momentum tensor as well. And it gives you the standard uh, perfect fluid formula for T meter. Okay. Now, the only thing that might seem a little puzzling in what I told you is that SU11 has a compact direction theta. There is no such compactness in the classical description of the Klebs parameterization. These are just three arbitrary real functions. You might say, well, then I have put in something extra by hand and not by doing SU11. The answer is yes, but I don't think it is a problem, problem because if I look at how the commutation rules work from here, from this term here, uh, rho is a left, it, sorry, it's a right translation of G. That's what it does, rho. Uh, that's just the smeared value of rho. And what it means is that if I take this particular operator U, e to the minus two pi i integral rho, that changes G to minus G. Okay. All the observers, because they are derived from things like G inverse DG here, they're going to be even. So they don't see that. So effectively, U is an identity operator. The effect of the compactness of that theta direction, which is conjugate to rho, is that therefore integral rho can be set to an integer. That is the so that is the extra non-classical ingredient that comes from using SU11. Okay. Is that a bad thing? No. If the fluid is made of particles, that's what you expect. So I would say that is in fact actually a good feature. And therefore we're going to accept that and go on from there. Okay. Uh, if you quantize vorticity as well, then instead of SU11, uh, instead of this, you want to make these two together into a compact S2 or something, you use SU2. You can do that actually. Okay. Uh, great. Okay. Now, once I have this commutation, sorry, the canonical structure following from this action, it's again, once again, trivial to check that the diffeomorphism algebra holds very well. There's no problem, no anomaly, nothing of that sort. And uh, the vorticity is related to U element like so. That's also clear. Now I want to ask, if I think in this language, in terms of group elements, what are the kind of topological terms that you can add? Okay. And you can simply look at various possible terms. There are many which I talk about in the, in the papers I mentioned, but I'm going to focus on two of them here. One is to take the third power of G inverse DG, multiply by some one form in three plus one or a zero form two plus one. That's a one kind of topological term. And there is another one, sigma three G inverse DG, which with some omega, which is a three form or a two form. And if it's close, there is no problem with this term. Okay. So these are two types of topological terms that we can add. And there are others too, but I'm not going to talk about that here. So what do we do? We take, so I'm going to look at I3 now first. So you start with the action. I'm only writing the time derivative here because my focus is on the canonical structure. Other terms can be added. If I now add this term, you see that I'm getting something like this. So I can take the time derivative here, put it together here, is this structure, okay? And rho bar is just the dual of omega. It is just what it is here, okay? So I can read out the canonical one form from here, uh, just from the time derivative, here's the canonical one form. The topological term as before does not contribute to the energy one and tensor. So you just vary the metric to arrive at its expression. Okay. Very good. So what happens? All I have to do then is I have the canonical structure here or follows from here, if you like. I can write down the Poisson bracket algebra from here. Take the expression for the energy moment and tensor coming from this theory. You don't need to do the Topological term for that is just this this classical term here, um, and just sit down and compute the commutation. And here is what comes out: there is something proportional to the vorticity. These are the test parameters, test functions. 
and then this quantity here. And so there is an anomalous term. Okay, that's what you. Now, of course, you might say, well, that doesn't sound right. Can we get rid of that? And the answer is yes. You can redefine, as I showed you before, a script T by subtracting a particular term. There is no norm. Okay. So, in this sense, there is no true anomaly in the theory, which makes sense because it's a two plus one dimensional theory. There's no gravitational anomaly. There should be no true anomaly. Okay. However, here is a problem. Uh, the, the shift between the two is done by this term. And that's also well defined in general. Okay, so there is no issue. However, if we impose the condition of incompressibility via a constraint, then this term is going to become not well defined anymore. Okay, so what happens is that if I impose this condition or a similar constitutive condition, then since rho is conjugate to theta and di theta occurs in B, it occurs in this term and it's not going to be well defined because you're fixing rho, theta is conjugate to it, and you need something that depends on theta to, to make this transformation between the two ways of writing the energy momentum tensor. Can we go back to mm -hmm. the original, uh, yes, yes, to this term. So we're talking about no, number one or number two? No, this, this term, number two, I3. And we can uh, write it uh, also in terms of uh, standard clips. Yeah, we can. Uh, yeah. What would it be? Um, what would it be? Uh, it will be similar to, um, you see, since I combined it here, it's a usual theta dot plus alpha beta dot, but there is an extra row bar here related to omega. And that's where the anomalous term would come from. Okay. Yeah. So you can write in the in the usual terms. Um, okay. So so the problem is the moment you impose this constraint, this way of shifting the T operator or the energy momentum tensor by this extra term doesn't work anymore because it's not a well defined thing to do, and therefore we have uh, a, a resulting anomaly, a, an anomalous computation algebra. Okay, that's the problem. Now, to actually relate it um, term by term to what uh, Paul and Sasha did, I imposed, first I had imposed this constitutive relation that I mentioned. And I also add another trivial term to this. This is in the sense of Lie algebra cohomology, trivial, so it doesn't produce any, any truly anomalous terms. It just shifts the nature of the anomaly by some extra terms. It's similar to the n in the n cube minus n of the Virasara algebra central term, okay? You know, but that the n cube is non-trivial, but the n is actually a matter of choice. You can shift it around a bit. Uh, it's that kind of stuff, okay? So that doesn't quite matter. And the only reason is because I want to be able to compare with the previous work uh, carefully, okay? So if I make this t tilde in this fashion, and then make complex combinations, compute the anomaly, this is exactly in agreement with what was computed by uh, in Paul's paper and also in uh, Bernard and Paul's paper. Okay. So, what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that we say that if I take this action with this topological term added, this term is added to ensure that I get this constitutive relation that I mentioned here. That's just a Lagrange multiplier A note I add to ensure that. And so here is the action. If I quantize this action, and I insist on this constitutive relation which ties down rho, then basically I have to live with this anomalous commutation. That's it, okay? Or if you try to eliminate it, you're going to lose target space diffeomorphism, which in this case is the SU11 target space, okay? That's, that is the issue. Uh, Okay, now I want to mention briefly the connection between this and um, the Chen Simons type way of looking at it. This is some newer work that we've been doing. Uh, so let's look at the Chen Simons Ginsburg Lando action, which is just what is written here. So there is an AMU, DMU, that's an A alpha, it's not alpha, A alpha. Um, and this, this is just a covariant derivative. I have an electromagnetic field and another little a field. Okay. 
So we're going to take this action, make a bunch of changes. Uh, I won't go through the technicalities. We're going to keep A node component as it is. We write AR use in the club way in terms of three parameters like so. Pi in the Madelung way of decomposing into modulus and taste. We write it like that. And then of course, this is just a name change. Put everything back in here. And this action becomes exactly this, which agrees exactly with the group theory way of writing it that I have here, except that here I've left H arbitrary. This is a particular Hamiltonian that's being chosen here. That's all. Okay. So the Chan Simons Ginsburg Lander theory can be mapped onto what I described, but with the specific choice of the Hamiltonian. So therefore, this is another way to think about what happens with the problem I mentioned. The, the, the advantage of this is that, you know, we know how to add surface terms and boundary terms here. So let me just spend a moment explaining what that is. So if I take this Chan Simons way of looking at it, or if you like this action, and look at the variational problem, that will tell me what the boundary conditions are. And you would expect these two boundary conditions in the in the problem. These are the ones which are allowed by the variational problem. Okay. The difficulty with that is if I take these equations, you know, here I'm considering a boundary here at y equal to zero, do a little pillbox type analysis here, integrate things over this region. Uh, outside there is no fluid, inside there is a fluid. And if you do that, you realize this is incompatible with continuity equation. So there is a violation of conservation loss, okay, coming from the boundary. Is it a surprise? Not particularly because, you know, you have an anomaly in the problem. So, you know, it is not completely surprising. Um, and what do we do? We can add a chiral boson field to fix up the boundary conditions. Here is what we do that to this particular form does the job. Uh, I should maybe go back and say that in what I initially said in terms of these topological terms, I did not add an electric field to the problem. If you add an electric field, that's the case we are discussing now. Okay, without the electric field, this problem doesn't arise. This incompatibility boundary condition doesn't arise. Okay. Remember, the first one says no tangential flow, no slip boundary condition. Um, normally, in fluid dynamics, you can impose no slip or no stress type boundary conditions. There are two different choices canonically made. What we are going to say is that there's an incompatibility. There is only a limited number allowed. Um, smaller number allowed. And once you add this H term, you can show that these are the boundary conditions. So you see that the no slip condition, Vx equal to zero is no longer allowed. Okay? And these are compatible with continuity. Okay? This is because of the anomaly into, and of course the problem goes away if I put the electric field to zero. Uh, so I just want to say that, that uh, comes in naturally. Now, one of the things I want to ask, the next thing I would like to ask is what happens if you try to play the same game in three dimensions, okay? What the example I gave you was in two dimensions, two space and time. We can do the same thing in three, similar terms exist. So let me start by writing the vorticity in, two, in, the, in the theory, which is the curl of V. It's a three vector. So let me call the three vectors nk times some magnitude omega. nk is a unit vector. So you can think of vortex lines like this, n points along the vortex direction. Uh, that's a unit vector. And here is a whole bunch of vortices. Okay. So we are playing the same game with vortices, but in the full three dimensional case. Okay. Same constitutive relation we can use. And you calculate in this case what happens with the Algebra, again, there is a, an extra term, which is related to the orientation of the vorticity vector and multiplied by some density factors. Okay. Now, what you might expect is therefore that if I have a dense collection of vortices, the modulus of N, sorry, the, yeah, sorry, modulus of omega will be approximately constant. Orientation can change from point to point. Uh, but you know the modulus is fixed, so you could. So it is like a two D vortex fluid, but kind of flowing along the vortex lines. Not flowing when there is a 
as a movement along the vortex direction. Uh, if the orientation is actually constant in some region, so they're more or less pointing in the same direction over some small region, then the extension term that I wrote down, this term here, the CK becomes a constant, you can pull it out here, and basically it becomes a central term. Okay. So that means you get a central extension, but the extension parameter is actually three vector in the front, a constant three vector. Uh, why is this interesting? Because if you take the three dimensional torus and you try to write down your um, vectors, which are the test functions, you can write them in this fashion in terms of two sets of integers. Uh, you assume that they are linearly independent except for uh, I mean, over the integers. So it's a bit similar to the, what I'm trying to say is, you recall that in the KAM theorem, there is a Diophantine condition on the, on the um, frequencies. If the Diophantine condition is not true, that is the case that we look, one looks at. If that's the case, then you can actually get uh, something that is effectively um, dense in terms of not, um, you know, a, a dense set of choices. They don't frequent in that in that example. It will be frequencies here. It will be these these parameters alpha and beta, and you can therefore construct um, essentially all kinds of vector fields from these these two. This suffices as a dense parameterization of vector fields on the three torus modulo the Stefan-Tain condition. If I look at this, then this extension turns out to be the same as what was found in some other work uh, by, by Rajiv. And therefore, I mean, I just wanted to connect it and that is why I went over this, okay? So there again, the work is not based on actions or anything, but I'm giving an action-based derivation for that. Um, but the, but the advantage is, you know, in showing this connection, I assume that N is approximately constant. The orientation doesn't change very much, but you don't need to do that. That really makes it central. It doesn't have to be central. It's some general extension and you can live with that, okay? So that will be the more general case. So it tells you how one might even generalize, okay? Um, you can write down the action for that case. Oh, sorry, I'm going to look at I2 now. Remember, I had two terms I showed you before, long ago, I guess. Oh, here we go. Two types of topological terms. I discussed mostly this one so far. I just want to look at this a little bit. Okay, so if I do this other term, that is G inverse DG cubed, which with some one form or zero form appropriately. So here is my action. Again, you can work through everything. You can work out the energy moment tensor. You can work out the commutation rules and so on. And here is what you would find, okay? B here is D of C. This is a cross product. And this is uh, in three plus one dimensions. And here is an extra term, okay? So again, once again, you have anomalous commutation rules. And this is the normal you need to find. And what's the meaning, physical meaning of C? Ah. So G are velocities basically clear or right. momentum clips and C. C is like the omega that you have in your work, which is the overall rotation. C okay. is sort of like magnetic field. Yeah, sort of like magnetic. So it's an ex externally controlled parameter. Okay. Uh, and so DCB, which is B, is what enters the central track. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is that you see G inverse DG cube trace this, if G is, of course, I mean, this is, if G is SU2, this is obviously the, the winding number. More generally, this is what is called the helicity. And sigma, this in, in the grand here, you might call the density for helicity. Mm -hmm. So that is the quantity that enters here. And therefore, uh, we know what this means. The helicity is really a measure of how vortices wind, I mean, knot into each other or have self knots and so on. Okay. Therefore, you would expect that this has something to do with looking at collections of knots in vortex lines. Okay. So, my, what I'm going to suggest is that if you look at, therefore, a 
a, a fairly tight knot in a vortex line, like I have shown here, think of this itself as a point particle. And if I have a lot of these things, as they move around, that is equivalent to a diffeomorphism that I can, okay? So similar to how you can write a vortex fluid in two plus one dimensions, you can write a knot fluid in three dimensions. And if I then ask, what is the anomalous commutator algebra that would be relevant for the knot fluid, my claim is that that would be this object here, this uh, action and this commutation over here. Okay. That's basically what I want to show you. That is an example of how you might consider, I mean, nobody has considered not fluids as far as I know, but if one were to sit down and think about it, this is the kind of thing that would be important, okay? So the take home lesson is that the conflict that I showed you between the target space diffeomorphism and the base space diffeomorphism can actually play out in, a, in explicit examples of how you construct these, you know, kind of a secondary fluids out of knots or what is this and so on, okay? So I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Questions? So you mentioned that vortices are in superfluid. Like if you have a medium superfluid, you see vortices, where do you see knots? Not in the superfluid necessarily. The knots arise in the three plus one context where you have the fluid line. And it can happen in superfluid helium, but you have to. My initial discussion did not take into that into account because I was doing just two dimensions. But if you do three dimensions, yes, the knots can one not. I mean, so the vortex lines can knot into themselves. Okay, and people have looked at such things in in the fluid dynamics context, and it's also known that what I call the helicity is related. It's the most elementary knot invariant you can write down. You, you may recall knots are classified by various things like Jones polynomials and so on. If you look at the most primitive version of that, which goes back to, I remember I called the Alexander polynomial, which was done already in the 1920s. That is essentially the helicity, okay? It's just the simplest abelian simple version of counting the knots. And uh, that is the topological term I was using. Okay. So, okay. And, and this topological the, the thermal interaction it could be written in terms of physical yes. observables yes. like velocity or well, only through clips, or it cannot be written through. Uh, it can be written in terms, in terms of, of velocities. Uh, the clips, there is a little bit of a catch because what the clips should miss is the overall topology of the group sometimes. So you have to be careful when you write in terms of clips. Uh, you recall that um, the main problem, main obstruction to writing a Lagrangian for fluid dynamics was precisely the helicity. Because if you look at the Poisson bracket algebra, it was known that it's a Poisson bracket system for a long time. If you look at the Poisson bracket algebra, then the helicity is like a Casimir in main. So it's a zero mode of the, or, or the Poisson bracket structure. So you cannot invert to find the the grand structure, which is what you need for the inverse of the omega, inverse of the inverse of the Poisson structure, which would be omega, you could not find. That was a problem. So if you fix the helicity, then perturbations around a fixed helicity can be completely parameterized by clutch. And then you can write down an action. And the same issue could arise here. So if you try to write in terms of purely in terms of clutch, you have to be careful, you may miss the topology. So that's the thing. But modular that yes, it can. But if I uh, interest to write the action in terms of physical yeah. observables, like uh, uh, velocity, velocity is fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's, it's, fine. it's local expression. Or yes, local expression. And it can be written in covariant way or in coordinates of the in, in covariant way. Mm -hmm. With higher derivatives. Uh, no, this the one I showed you does not have high value. The coefficients are yeah. dimensional field. Yes. That's right.
This also definitely means that if you put uh, the system in external field, like electric field or gauge field, uh, it will show um, response function will show standard to normal Oh, so the the knots. It's interesting to see that. I don't think oh, I have to look at that. Yeah. It's very similar to what you did in 2 plus 1. So it's one, one step higher. So did, uh, 